returning to Wittenberg. And he followed their advice. You see, the reformer listened to his friends. The man of God listens to his advisors. And he never thinks he knows it all. As Luther did, and this listening to his advisors saved his life. Continuing. He followed their directions as well as he could. A horse that Staupitz had left at his disposal was brought to the door of the convent. Once more he bids adieu to his brethren. He then mounts and sets out with a bridle for his horse, without boots or spurs, and unarmed. The magistrate of the city had sent him as a guide, a horseman who was well acquainted with the roads. This man conducts him in the dark through the silent streets of Augsburg. They direct their course to a little gate in the wall of the city. One of the counselors, Lang Langamatel, had ordered that it should be open to him. He is still in the legate's power. The hand of Rome is still over him. Doubtless, if the Italians knew that their prey was escaping, the cry of pursuit would be raised. Who knows whether the intrepid adversary of Rome may not still be seized and thrown into prison. At last, Luther and his guide arrive at the little gate. They pass through. They are out of Augsburg. And putting their horses into a gallop, they soon leave the city far behind them. Luther, ar Luther urged his horse and kept the poor animal at full speed. He called to mind the real or supposed flight of John Huss, the manner in which he was overtaken, and the assertion of his adversaries who affirmed that Huss, having by his flight annulled the emperor's safe conduct, that they had a right to condemn him to the flames. However, these uneasy feelings did not long occupy Luther's mind. Having got clear from the city where he had spent ten days under the terrible hand of Rome, which had already crushed so many thousand witnesses for the truth, and shed so much blood, at large breathing the open air, traversing the villages and plains, and wonderfully delivered by the arm of the Lord, his soul overflowed with praise. He might well say, quote, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we, have, we are delivered. Thus was the heart of Luther filled with joy. Our heart is in the name of God, who made heaven and earth. But his thoughts again reverted to Deville. Quote, the cardinal, thought he, would have been well pleased to get me into his power and send me to Rome. He is no doubt mortified that I have escaped from him. He thought he had me in his clutches in Osberg. He was holding an eel by the tail. Shame that these people should set so high a price on me. They would give many crowns to have me in their power, whilst our Savior Christ was sold for thirty pieces of silver. Luther reached Wittenberg on the 30th of October and found on his arrival that the disappointed legate had written a letter to the elector, breathing vengeance against, quote, the contemptible monk that had escaped him and earnestly entreating Frederick to send him as a prisoner to Rome or at least to banish him from his territories. The elector refused to deliver up Luther to the tender mercies of Rome, and the reformer appealed from the decision of the Pope to a general council. This appeal was made at Wittenberg in the chapel of Corpus Christi on the 28th of November, 1518. History of Romanism by John Dowling, 1845, concerning Luther under the chapter Popery on a Tottering Throne. This is the great Martin Luther. This is the Luther who was intrepid, who was fearless. And do you know why, my brethren in Christ, why this man was fearless? Because he had read the Scriptures, that the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whosoever trusteth the Lord shall be safe. That needs to be you, my brethren, especially my white brethren in Christ at this moment, because we are being assailed by fear after fear after fear through the press, through the news, from Washington, wars, blah, blah, blah. And the Word of God will give us the courage we need to stand against the Pope and the fears he seeks to conquer us with. Indeed, fear conquers the heart of men, and fear renders us incapable of resisting papal tyranny. 
The wild beggars of the sea, the Dutch sailors, were known for their ferocity far and wide because they had the word of God in their hearts and they had heard it preached to them in the open fields of the Netherlands by the great preachers of that day who believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven. And when these Dutchmen realized that, they had no more fear of the priests or the Pope. And when they hit the high seas to fight the Spanish, who were controlled by the Pope, to destroy the little Dutch Republic, these wild beggars of the sea would engage in war. And they ran from nobody with crescents on their caps, written in the Dutch language, rather Turkish than Popish. You see, my white brethren, when you get the Spirit of God inside you and that Holy Ghost starts working through you because He enlivens and illuminates you to the truth of that book, the AV 1611, there is nobody who can stand against you. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who are to we be? If the Lord be for us, who are to we fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid, saith the psalmist? Yeah. That's why David confront Goliath <laughs> and say, just as I killed the bear and just as I killed the lion, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to cut your head off. You blasphemer, how dare you outrage the armies of the God of Israel? And this little boy flung that stone and God took the stone, hit him in the forehead, killed him dead. David cut off his head. You see, with God, we're in the majority, my white brothers in Christ. And we have nothing to fear in what's unfolding in our great example in 1518 in Martin Luther. When he stands before the legate and realizes that he's going to be arrested, it's time to play it smart and exit stage left. And God delivered him that he would fight another day at Worms when he would be before the Holy Roman Emperor and the legate and the cardinal and hundreds of dukes and margraves and royals there, and he would stand and say, It's neither safe nor right to go against conscience. My mind is captivated to the Scriptures, to the Word of God. So help me, here I stand. I cannot change. And it's because of the courage of that one man, Martin Luther, that now the nobles got some courage. You lawyers need the same courage. You statesmen need the same courage. The same courage that was in Martin Luther because of faith can be in you. So you can stand up in Congress and say, we're not going along with the, with the health reform. We're not going along with hate crimes bills. And we're not going to continue this crusade against Islam. We're bringing our boys home. Amen. Because after all, George Bush and company brought down the World Trade Center. I love the day when some congressman or some senator would have the guts and faith enough to do that. All we need is one, just one, and that's what the devil hates. It's always one man somewhere in some venue raining on his parade, and he doesn't want that to happen. Will it be you? If the Lord could use Luther to do that, he can use you too, wherever you are and whatever you do. It's the same Holy Spirit in Luther. It's in you if you're in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you need to be. Have you truly repented of your sin? Have you truly believed that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures? That He was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures? And is coming back again according to the Scriptures? Do you understand that once you believe that glorious gospel, your sins are washed away by the precious blood that He shed at Calvary for you? That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of your sins. He shed his ruby red blood drops for you. And now it's time for you to repent. Time to believe. Because God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. But Eric John Phelps, please pray for me. For the Lord bless you. Glory to the Lord.